October 22 is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. Welcome to the Avenue History Podcast, episode number 64, Will and Arthur's Excellent Adventure. Last time, we finished up our look at the life and influence of George McReady Price, his debate in London, and we met Uncle Arthur. We also talked about the fundamentalist politics of American Seventh-day Adventists and how economic socialism and theological liberalism became married together in the minds of fundamentalists till death do them part. This time... We're not even going to use the word fundamentalism. I mean, except right there. And in the time before that, we are moving on from fundamentalism. Okay, that was the last time, I promise. We begin by talking about the legacy of Arthur G. Daniels. In 1901, when he took office as General Conference President, there were 75,000 Adventists in the world, with tithes sitting somewhere around a million dollars. Now, Adventists had a presence in fewer than 40 territories, countries around the world. By the time Daniels was demoted after 21 years of service and leadership, global Adventist membership was somewhere around 200,000. And they had a tithe of about 4 million or so. Membership tripled, tithe quadrupled and fully 20% of delegates to the General Conference session in 1922 were from outside the United States. 20% of delegates. Now, when Daniels took office, he one of his first tasks was to move the General Conference from Battle Creek to Maryland. They packed everything uh, into some train cars, and as they went east, they were so broke they had to stop at camp meetings along the way to ask for money to keep the train moving. In the end, Daniels' tenure was an unqualified success, no matter how you look at it or how matter how you slice it. But that doesn't mean everyone saw it that way. We've talked a little in the past about the successful smear campaign against Daniels, and not all of it was smear, I should say. Some of it was smear, and sometimes it was hard for Daniels and others to tell the difference between the, the smear part of it and the legitimate criticisms that some people had uh, that, that led up to the 1922 General Conference session. Our old friends Holmes and Washburn were involved, fancying themselves Brutus and Cassius and saving Rome from this Adventist Caesar, no doubt. After 21 years of wearing the crown, there were more than a few Adventists who thought Daniels had grown maybe a little bit too comfortable with it. They were ready for a change. Among them was Dr. George Harding, brother of Warren G. Harding, the President of the United States. And this controversy was ugly. It was awkward. It was public. The session had its hands full managing things. I mean, a number of delegates worked in secret whipping up support against Daniels before coming out openly against him. There was enough frustration with Daniels that renominating him turned out not to be an option. Just couldn't give him four more years. Uh, you had to acknowledge the people that were against him. But there was enough support for Daniels that just kicking him to the curb wasn't going to happen either. His supporters and detractors kind of fought it out while he tried to keep himself aloof from this as long as he could, which meant that the nominating committee got nowhere. And it was embarrassing that Daniels wasn't immediately reelected. Embarrassing that it was happening in front of 500 delegates from around the world. Daniels' right-hand man, William Spicer, was proposed as a compromise candidate. He received 29 votes to Daniels' 20. Now, Spicer was a Daniels ally, so that should make Daniels' friends happy. But he was also not Daniels, so that should make Daniels' enemies happy. But Spicer was no backstabber. He wasn't going to take Daniels' job knowing that Daniels still wanted it. And he certainly wasn't going to take it getting 59% of the vote. I mean, that's not exactly a, you know, hey, we're so happy to have you. He knew that that 59% of the vote was not entirely due to his own impressive qualifications. Okay, part of that, a large part of that perhaps was a, was a protest vote. You know, we like you better than the other guy. Anyone wanting to be General Conference President back then wanted to be 
a unanimous choice, which expressed the full confidence of the church in your leadership. Besides, Spicer said, at 56 years old, he believed a younger man should get the job. Now, Daniels had considered stepping down in 1920, okay? He didn't want to do this thing for life. Ironically, though, it was the opposition of people like Holmes and Washburn that encouraged him to serve another term. Daniels wanted to go out with dignity. He wanted to walk out the front door smiling and waving, not slipping out of the back door in the dark, disgraced. Okay, He felt he deserved some kind of dignity. I mean, he had poured himself into this job for over two decades. He didn't want to go out like this. So the plan concocted by his friends was that he would serve one more term while grooming a successor, and they had a successor in mind, and this would enable Daniels to go out on top, right? He'd be unanimously reelected in 1922. His enemies would, would kind of keep it together, keep their mouths shut, let him serve. Meanwhile, he would choose a protege to replace him who was acceptable to them. And so Daniels' friends thought this was a good compromise, but the plan was turned down. Didn't want anything to do with it. They wanted Daniels gone now. Oh, and Spicer wasn't the preferred choice to succeed Daniels in that scenario. Now, the drama that unfolded was largely sanitized from Avenist newspapers, but not secular ones. The Oakland Tribune used words like political plot and serious rupture to describe the situation. Now, no doubt these secular papers had an incentive to kind of uh, play it up. Right? They love the drama of it. And all of that, so it's it's hard to know, uh, you know, where they're exaggerating, or or you know, are they upplaying it so much, or are the Avenist papers downplaying it so much? You know, it's hard to figure out where exactly the truth is, in terms of the things being described as said and done. But what we do know is that it was awkward for both Daniels and Spicer. Spicer you know, getting 59% of the vote, refused the job, and Daniels didn't have enough votes to keep the job. And Daniels realized his name wasn't going anywhere, so he just took it out of consideration. Daniels complained about the indignity of the process. He let people know how he felt about it, and it was undignified. But then Daniels pushed Spicer to accept the nomination, which he did. The result was that Spicer and Daniels switched jobs. This wasn't some Putin Medvedev thing either, where wink, wink, and nod, nod, Daniel still wielded power through his puppet, Spicy Spicer. If you know anything about William Spicer, by the way, he very much does not deserve that nickname. Okay, it does not match his personality at all. But he's dead, and I'm not, so I'm calling him Spicy. Now, the role of General Conference Secretary was largely whatever you wanted it to be. During his presidency, Daniels was largely tied up with the Maryland move, the close-to-home conflicts with Kellogg, Lewis Sheaf, Holmes, Washburn, all of that stuff, and also getting the church institutions out of debt. As secretary, Spicy chose to focus on mission work. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But for someone like Daniels, secretary was the best possible place to land. He finally felt free to work on the projects he enjoyed. So during the first year as secretary, Daniels delegated most of his desk work to his assistant back in Maryland while he stayed in the West. It seems that many of his enemies were concentrated in Washington and Pennsylvania, and no doubt it felt good to be away from all of that. Daniels had the advantage of also being an elder statesman, so President Spicy and others mostly left him alone. Like sometimes when they would contact Daniels to be like, hey, this is actually part of your job and we need you to do it. We're so sorry to have to ask you to do it. Right? Like sometimes they were almost apologetic to ask Daniels to do his job. I mean, that's kind of the, the respect and prestige that he commanded among the general conference leadership. Now, a lesser man might have collected his salary and just coasted it until retirement, but not Daniels. When, when Daniels did return east, he returned to preach in New York City to try out a new kind of evangelistic series. And get this, 20-minute sermons followed by some sharing time, right? It's like some testimony time. Somewhere in the universe, A.T. Jones at that moment, who famously preached for hours, who 
may have been banned from various conferences because he spoke too long. He's like, 20-minute sermons? What do you do in 20 minutes? I can't even, like, say hello in 20 minutes. And somewhere else in the universe, I mean, not really because of the State of the Dead thing, but Ellen White is happy that Daniel says, hey, you're doing urban evangelism. You're doing city work, and I pushed so hard to get you to go preach in the city. And he's finally doing it. So good on you, Daniels. I'm sure that 20-minute sermon thing will totally catch on. Now, Daniels' passion project ended up being the new ministerial association, which he took the reins of. He had always wanted to do more to develop the church's pastors, but his role as president prevented him from focusing too much on any one thing. He began traveling across America, getting Adventist pastors to deeply study the Bible and Ellen White for days on end. And, and many of these pastors loved it. Daniels was energized by it. Many of these pastors that Daniels was studying with never went to college. And I wonder if Daniels had in mind Washburn and Holmes as he began educating these pastors. Was Daniels thinking, if only more of these pastors had had better theological education, they wouldn't so easily believe the troublemakers out there. Daniels also received letters uh, soliciting him for advice, uh, giving them a pastoral perspective on various problems, like how do you know when someone is ready for baptism? Well, Daniels began mailing out the answers, and he would copy his answers and send them to others. You know, he thought they might be interested in those answers. And eventually, he finally got enough funding to produce a magazine, which he called, creatively enough, The Ministry. I know, it's catchy. The young Larry Froome joined Daniels along with a who's who's list of uh, you know, future denominational leaders, including several future General Conference presidents. Curiously, Daniels pitched the ministry as a way to boost what he called efficiency. This was in the inaugural issue. He wanted to boost the efficiency uh, of pastors, that is to train them how to get the results they expect without wasted effort. Now, Froome wrote an article whose title could have been like a spiritual bestseller in the airport today. It was called Irresistible Power in a Movement Whose Time Has Come. That's, I mean, look, Adventism is full of like the least creative titles ever. It was just kind of like a trademark of the 19th century and early 20th century. But I really like that title. That's, that's kind of intriguing. Irresistible Power in a Movement Whose Time Has Come. I dig that. Good job, Froome. There was an article on preaching by a missionary in China, another on the interior spiritual life of the pastor, written by a missionary in Argentina. There was even an article titled, The Ideal Minister's Wife, which sounds a bit old-fashioned in a more cynical age. It begins with the immortal words of many pastoral spouses, It was not my choice to be a minister's wife. <laughs> yeah, that's a truism. Uh, but it goes on to say, quote, first of all, a minister's wife should be an ideal wife and a good homemaker, end quote. Yeah, let's move on. There were more articles covering the pastor and his finances, some sermon illustrations, a Bible commentary section, updates from around the world, and a little Q&A corner. The first question which Froome fielded, the first question was, Will you explain how so many extreme positions can apparently be sustained by quotes from the spirit of prophecy? Froome's answer is just legendary. For three words, by their misuse. I love it. You go, Froome. One wonders if Froome had some particular Adventists in mind. I don't know. But the ministry also recommended some book collections, routinely mixing uh, Ellen White books with non-Adventist books, getting people to read outside of what the denomination was uh, uh, publishing. Now, the ministry, now it's just called Ministry, still being published today, was really groundbreaking in the history of Adventist publishing. I mean, as you, as you can tell from the, the articles that I've mentioned, it was incredibly practical. Daniels may have been afraid to let his voice of moderate Adventism be heard in 1919, but ministry was distinctly and unapologetically in Daniels' voice, in a new generation's voice. Now, that he wasn't trying to keep his throne he let his voice be heard. Now, the real success of Daniels' second act, as his biographer calls it, was in shaping the next generation of Adventists. Leroy Froome, then in his 30s, would of course go on to be a popular uh, figure 
whose fame peaked during the Questions and Doctrine controversy in the 1950s, and William Henry Branson, then in his early 40s and posted to Africa, we'll hear more about him in a minute, would go on to be GC president during the 50s. Daniels poured himself into the education of young Adventists in ministry. In the 1930s, another of Daniels' colleagues from these days became the first head of of what would eventually be known as the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. So whereas Spicer had focused on the missionaries when he was secretary, Daniels focused on the pastors. The professionalization of the Adventist ministry, which we have today, right, the the culture that encourages you to go get your MDiv and the subsidies for that and all that sort of stuff, uh, it it owes much to Daniels' great second act in his life. If you're going to spend your last years on something, it might as well be forming and equipping and resourcing and encouraging the next generation. Now that brings us back to Spicy. If you visit Adventist institutions in India today, Spicer Adventist University is going to be somewhere near the top of your list. Despite the fact that a Tennessee missionary named Gentry Lowry founded the school and ultimately gave his life in India, uh, the school was named after William A. Spicer, William Ambrose Spicer, a church administrator, missionary, right, who spent three early years in India. And at first glance, that kind of hardly seems fair. I mean, come on, Gentry. Now, when you go through the records, you see Spicer's name a lot in the minutes of various committees starting in the 1890s. He was among the first generation of Adventists to grow up in a, in a protective bubble. At, at 16, he was working at the sanitarium in Battle Creek, served as John Harvey Kellogg's secretary. He was also Stephen Haskell's secretary in England. And when he returned to America, he was the secretary for foreign missions at the General Conference. A few years later... That's when the church gave him a choice between India or South Africa, and he chose India. And when you look at Spicer's life on paper, you're seeing a guy who got a general conference gig in his 20s, got to travel the world young, early in life. He was the secretary of two famous great Adventists, and when he went to England and India, he was a publisher. He's not the the pioneer. He's not the first one on the ground. If this was World War I, then Spicer isn't the private in the trenches, he's the, he's the guy who gets assigned to the general staff, right? He gets to drive the general around uh, in, in the Jeep. Okay, I know they didn't have Jeeps in World War I, but you, but you get the idea, right? He's just one of those quiet guys in the history books, the guys who seems to kind of like climb up the ladder faster than other people. Uh, but he's also easy to overlook. And that impression of Spicer is hard to shake. It is. Uh, And it's also unfair. I mean, missionaries were the new pioneers when Spicer was growing up. And there wasn't much pioneering to do in America by the time Spicer came of age. The Adventist Church was a big organization in the 1890s. And without efficient organization, then foreign missions and probably the future of the church itself would have suffocated. By one estimate, there were only two years in Spicer's general conference career where he didn't manage uh, to, to visit or help a mission field somewhere. Sure, Daniel's fighting with Kellogg and having tensions with Ellen White makes for better drama. It makes us feel like Daniel's is truly at the top, right? He's like a lion fighting these other lions. He's doing something. And it makes people like Spicer, who quietly go about their jobs with excellence, harder to notice. But The fact that Spicer is so easy to overlook and misunderstand also says a lot about how we view history. We want want the Alexander the Greats, right? We're attracted to the doers, to the Hollywood in our history. And Spicer wasn't that guy. He was a nice guy. He was a nice guy at his election, okay? He told the delegates, quote, It has taken a little time to get used to the brethren's coming and saying they want to shake hands with the new president. That is all right, but you are shaking hands with the same brother you have known all the time. And if I smile at you, do not think I'm smiling because I am president. I'm smiling because I love you as I press your hand, end quote. Oh, come on, man. Just bring it in for a hug. Come here, Spicy. What an everyman. Just a good guy. But Spicy wasn't bland. Okay, He had strong views on things, and he was just one of those people that, that stuff didn't stick to. I mean, do you remember the controversy over revising Ellen White's great controversy in 1911? Prescott enthusiastically pushed uh, to bring the history of that book up to date, which earned the eternal suspicion of more conservative Adventists because they believed he was tampering 
with a prophetic book, with scripture itself, according to some people. Prescott sure took it on the chin, and he bore those wounds in that experience for the rest of his life. We're going to talk about that again when we catch back up with him in the early 1930s. But my point is that Spicer had the exact same opinion as Prescott, and people just largely didn't notice. Spicer is like that friend in your class in sixth grade. You could stand right next to each other, and you can say the exact same thing to your teacher, but you're going to get detention, and he won't. He was quiet. He was thoughtful. He was focused. He was sincere. Yes, maybe he lacked the fun bits of character, which, which makes telling Daniels and Prescott's story so much fun, but he also didn't have the rough edges. And in, in many situations, Spicy was just kind of nearly invisible. And I say nearly invisible because there were times when his presence was very much noticed, especially when he became president. The people wanting to build the Glendale Sanitarium sure noticed him. Kellogg's conflict with church leaders wasn't just because personalities clashed. There was an inherent tension within Adventism between the medical work and the ministry work. I mean, I say medical work and, mis- and ministry work, but you understand, I mean, like the, the early medical work, it was supposed to be medical mission work, all right? It wasn't envisioned to be distinct from the uh, evangelistic or pastoral ministry work, okay? But we're just going to make that distinction now. It's just easier uh, for sake of time. But sanitariums and later hospitals, man, they cost a ton of money, and their, their focus is local. It's on physical needs and emotional needs uh, a little bit. Uh, it's, it focuses on the here and now, right, in this world, making this world better. Whereas pastors and missionaries out there and evangelists, they're worrying about the long term, right? How is your soul? They're focused on the spiritual, the the there and then, not the here and now. And what's more, there was a tension for sanitarium workers to get paid market equitable rates. Church leaders wanted everyone on the same pay scale, right? Let's all sacrifice together. They allowed pastors to make $20 a week while understanding that the medical pay scale would necessarily have to be higher. Okay, you can't pay doctors $20 a week. So under Spicer's administration, doctors could make uh, up to about $53 a week. But you know how much you could make if you were a doctor at a non avenous hospital? About $179 a week, almost four times as much. And yeah, yeah, I mean, we should all be motivated by our service to Jesus, not salary, right? We're medical missionaries. We're not just kind of professional doctors. But it was no secret that though pastors made $1,000 a year, that was also roughly the going rate for pastors in America back then, okay? So, you know, from a certain perspective, if you're a doctor, you could easily have this perspective that, yeah, okay, you pastors say that we should, we should, you know, we should view ourselves as missionaries, but you guys are basically getting paid what every other pastor gets paid. We're getting paid a quarter of what other people in our field, you know, get paid. How about you guys live on $5 a week? You guys get paid a quarter. And let's see, you know, if you guys are going to say, well, we should all sacrifice and just kind of, you know, right? Why do they get paid the market rate and we have to sacrifice? And on the other hand, Church leaders just knew that certain sanitariums were giving huge bonuses and other forms of compensation to their employees. You know, we'll stay on the same pay scale, but wink, wink, here's a Christmas bonus equal to half of your salary. Now, the healthcare environment suggested a different focus, an additional set of values than just missionary or ministry service. The money wasn't the problem. It was a symptom of the two different worlds that were beginning to exist within the church, which still exist within the church. Anyway, these tensions had to be resolved somehow when it came to the Glendale Sanitarium early in Spicer's presidency. If you read the history of the sanitarium on their website, today it's called Avenus Health Glendale, you'll read that the sanitarium ran out of room in the early 1920s, needed to build a larger facility a little further out of town. That's entirely true. But there's a lot more to that story. The sanitarium there was basically a large Victorian house uh, bought uh, at the turn of the century. And the city of Glendale was exploding in growth, like probably the fastest growing city in America at the time. And it was beginning to look like that one house that refused to sell. And now it's surrounded by like a Walmart and a Target and a PetSmart. And you know, you, you know what I'm talking about? Like the these developers come up, they buy up a lot of land, and like that one person refuses to sell, and then it's just like they're surrounded by a sea of parking lots and like stores, and it just looks terrible now. Uh, except, you know, in this case, 
when the city of Glendale is growing, your land isn't worthless. On the contrary, it was worth so much money. I mean, I think they bought the property for about $12,000, right, in the early 1900s. And now in the early 1920s, like 20 years later, they're like, we can sell this thing for $200,000. Okay, that's crazy. So they get excited about that. Now we can just, we can sell this property. We can build a bigger place and we can just move a little bit further out of the city. We can have fresh air and we can have quiet. We can have peace. We can, we can use that money to, you know, be able to help more people and we'll never have to move again, right? Because I'm sure Los Angeles, this area isn't growing, right? It's just going to stop where it is. So we'll never be, you know, in the center of the city again. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, and when they when they when they kind of pitch this to the church, they write these articles in uh, the review and stuff. They emphasize like the conservativeness of this project. You know, it's like, well, we were thinking we we're going for, like from seventy five beds. We we're thinking about going up to one hundred and fifty, and then we're like, ah, you know what? That's too expensive. So we cut it back down to like one hundred and twenty nine or something, right? We're trying to save money. Then we thought we were gonna, you know, build this, and we're like, you know what? If we kind of just rearranged our floor plan a little bit, we can save fifty thousand dollars, right? And so they they kind of they kind of pitch this to the churches is, is like we're you know we have this focus on saving money, we want to be cost effective, like they know their audience, and so they were just they just need a few dollars. Like they're going to save so much money with this move. It's it's in every way an advantage. We just need a few dollars. What's interesting is that one local developer in Glendale, they were ecstatic that the sanitarium was moving, like too eager. Like, just chill, guys. This developer ran ads in several newspapers with this line, quote, Like a dam stemming the fall of a surging stream, the Glendale Sanitarium has held back the full flow of prosperity. End quote. <laughs> like, what kind of ad is this? And then it goes on, quote, Many have sought to purchase the site of the Glendale Sanitarium, for a business subdivision, but their entreaties fell upon deaf ears, end quote. Like, developer dudes, totally uncool. Like, you're trying to promote the attractiveness of this development. You want people to buy, you know, buy this from you. You don't have to trash the people who owned it before. Like, you don't have to do this, man. They're like that guy in high school, and it's like, finds out you broke up with, uh, with your girl, or your guy, and it's like, oh man, I'm so happy you broke up with Janet, so I have a chance to date her. Man, you were in my way for so long. And like, like you don't have to say that out loud, man. It's just totally uncool. Yeah. Anyways, that's how I visualize this developer, you know, in California, totally uncool. But the developer gives us a hint here because they mention that the old sanitarium property was being sold below market value because of the need to quickly raise cash to build a new sanitarium. So did the sanitarium sell the property for less than they led the church to believe? Like, did they get $200,000? Did they sell it for less to, to liquidate it quickly? Or was $200,000 the, you know, lesser value? Or maybe the maybe the developer was just trying to drum up interest. You know, they were trying to entice people. Oh, we're going to give you such a good deal in this property. These people, they just, they sold it for nothing. Like, even if they did sell it for for, for less than $200,000. I mean, the return on investment over 20 years from 12000 to somewhere around 200000 is still insane. But anyways, the, the reason why I, I raise this is because the new sanitarium, of course, went way over budget. No matter what they wrote in the review about how they were going to save all this money, they went way over budget. They anticipated it would cost maybe about $800,000. Local papers reported... Construction cost was somewhere around $1.5 or $1.2 million. So, yeah, pretty close, guys. But by all accounts, it was a nice hospital. So you have that going for you. I mean, the governor of California was invited for its opening, and it, it ended up being, uh, by at least one opinion, like the nicest institution in Adventism at the time. Now, Spicy and the General Conference Committee sent some money, but they were not amused at all. In Spicer's view, America was just way too institutionalized, and for the price of building yet another hospital or school in America, you could build like dozens anywhere else in the world. And this was William Branson's point, 
a future GC president who was then serving in Africa, as we mentioned, for $800,000, Branson said, we could build here in Africa 57 mission stations, 26 medical clinics, five training schools for native workers, several offices, and still have enough money left over to send to Europe the, the, for, for help in North Africa. The European division had responsibility for North Africa. And so he's basically saying, like, we could just do all of this with the same amount of money it takes them to build a new sanitarium. Uh, and he just had a point, I guess. I mean, his tone was biting. You know, what's better, to build 57 mission stations in Africa, China, India, South America, or, quote, the building of one more sanitarium in America, end quote. It's amazing how things have changed, right? Boy, the heyday of building these sanitariums as fast as you can all around the world, you know, and building more in America, it's like, now that perspective has changed, and it's like, do we really need another hospital in America? I mean, really? Do we? Now, Spicer lived the missionary life, by, by all accounts. He slept in his seat when he took the train, refused to pay for the sleeper car. He would snack on peanuts all day rather than buy food. And when the general conference budget was tight, he would sometimes save his own salary, set it aside just in case a request for a little money came from some forgotten mission station somewhere in the world. Okay, he was a missionary at heart. And there was no possible way... Spicer was going to miss Branson's point here. So after voting to send a few thousand dollars to Glendale and urging Adventists to, hey, you know, send them, send Glendale some money and, and get them out of debt, the General Conference Committee voted the new policy. We have enough institutions in North America and we're not going to be building anymore. We're not going to support the building of any more. The Adventist future, as Spicer saw it, wasn't in large institutions, but in a ton of little ones scattered everywhere. Now, it was during the 1920s that we see this the rift opening between American Adventism and the rest of the world, right? As Branson was kind of illustrating, even though Branson was American, uh, he had responsibility there in Africa. And, and you see this kind of frustration with how resources were being allocated. In the early 1900s, church leaders fled Battle Creek with the blessing of Ellen White, who feared the concentration of so many Adventists in one specific place. And just 20 years later, Adventist communities like Little Battle Creeks had grown up around the major hospitals and universities. The flight from Battle Creek didn't change. The fact that large institutions have their own gravity, they promote their own values, their own culture, their own community, they form their own community. And, and, and then they inevitably lead to large churches with immense influence growing up around them. And as we've seen, the, the missionaries overseas were bothered by the consumption of these resources in America, and they're still bothered to this day. Their little clinics and sanitariums abroad found it hard to attract the American doctors they needed, and so they couldn't grow as fast as they wanted. They couldn't become as big as the sanitariums and hospitals were in America. Sanitariums like Glendale and Loma Linda and Hinsdale could pay doctors and nurses more. They could offer them more in terms of amenities and and the prospect of being on the cutting edge of medicine. I mean, when Glendale was built, you know, they put a state-of-the-art uh, x-ray equipment in there as well. Young people who might have been evangelists or missionaries a generation ago, now they had a different option. They could have an attractive career path at Adventist hospitals. Now, Spicer and other church leaders predictably saw this as a spiritual problem, right? Our hospitals are becoming worldly. We're not as spiritually committed or as connected as our pioneers were. And speaking of our pioneers, when John Loughborough died in 1924, shortly after the new Glendale Sanitarium opened, like weeks later, the last of the Adventist pioneers were gone. General conference sessions and Adventist review articles of this era went out of their way to forge a kind of connection with their past. They'd put the pictures of James and Ellen and, you know, Haskell, you know, all these people, like they put their pictures up in, in, the, uh, in the newspapers and stuff to remember them, to make these connections to the past. They were anxious not to lose their way now that the old guardians were gone. But this wasn't entirely a spiritual problem. I mean, the, the leaders simply didn't understand the social effects of these large institutions, that it wasn't anything the hospitals were necessarily doing wrong. I mean, when you pay doctors the going rate, I'm going to really oversimplify this, okay? When you pay doctors the going rate, you create income inequality among church workers. Enough income inequality for enough time inevitably creates class inequalities, and this higher class 
uh, Adventism will inevitably attract a different class of people than are attracted to opportunities teaching in rural Canada or preaching in urban China, right? And these different classes that form will develop slightly different values and ways of seeing things. And again, I'm oversimplifying the situation, but I just I want to sketch out the genesis of a lingering paradigm tension within Adventism today in a way that, you know, doesn't just devolve into pointing fingers, you know, this side lacks conviction or whatever. Okay? It's worth thinking about these things. It's, it's worth understanding where these kind of tensions come from. They're just inherent in the system because these hospitals, these medical communities, and many times even the universities were, were, were focused on building professional relationships and developing ourselves along kind of professional modern lines. And we're, our work is focused on the here and now, right? We're trying to heal the people in our communities right now, meet the needs right now, whereas... You know, evangelists and missionaries, they, they tend to be kind of looking, uh, transcending the moment, looking towards and building for the future, right? And they're focused on the spiritual, not the not the immediate felt needs. And so you know, with these kind of two different perspectives, it's just inherent with the, the work of evangelists and inherent with the work of uh, medical professionals that they look at things this way. And, and over time, as, as these things develop, this kind of uh, kind of two different bubbles end up being formed. But that's where we'll leave that for right now. Maybe we'll talk about that some more in the future. I want to just say that that Spicy had to balance missionary needs and institutional needs. He had a missionary heart. He was in a job uh, at the head of a, of a giant institution, right, the General Conference. And he had to kind of figure out how best to balance that, as Daniels had to as well. But he also had another problem on his plate, a problem the last two General Conference presidents had also a problem the next two general conference presidents would have. And this problem landed on Spicer's plate the moment an Adventist in New York City went to see the commissioner of public welfare to get a permit. Hey, asked the commissioner, do you know James K. Humphrey? Is he a member of your denomination? The Adventist was cautious. Uh, yes. Oh, good, said the commissioner. Then can you explain this? And he just drops a 27-page document. A call was made to the General Conference. William Ambrose Spicer, Spicy, was about to take his turn in dealing with the color line. 